Um, this is a scripture that God laid on my heart back in December, and then it snowed. And uh, I just couldn't quite put this away because I feel like it is a message that, that we all need to hear, especially as we begin this new year. It's a message about peace. And so I know that some of us talked a little bit about this in our homes on that Sunday when we were watching the blizzard come down. Um, but we're going to look at it a little more closely today. And so I invite our attention to these few verses that come from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we come here this morning um, in this new year. We come here from the busyness of the Christmas season. We come here from many different places. Some are on high mountains, some are in low valleys. But we come. We come here to be with you. And we know that your word, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And it can penetrate into the depths of our hearts and souls and transform us more and more into your likeness. So, Lord, we're ready to listen. We just ask you now to speak. In Jesus' name. When my dad began his ministry in the United Methodist Church, now this was after 20 years of being in the Baptist Church, but when he began in the Methodist Church, his first appointment was a charge of two churches in Caswell County, one of them being Yanceyville United Methodist Church. The first Christmas that mom and dad were there, the children of the church put on a little play. Now, because the church was pretty small, a lot of the kids were related to each other, kind of like Salem. All was going well in the play, and each child managed to get to their correct places in the beautiful nativity scene. But as they sang their last carol, two of the wise men, who happened to be brothers, started pushing and shoving each other, which quickly escalated into an all-out brawl that involved them hitting each other over the head with the very gifts that they had brought for the baby Jesus. Now, as Dad retold the story years later, he commented on the irony that this most famous scene of the birth of the Prince of Peace was anything but peaceful that day as those two little wise men fought each other. <laughs> the irony of this story is one that we could easily recognize still today. Here we are on this Epiphany Sunday, this Sunday where we celebrate the coming of the wise men to see the baby Jesus. We're still celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, who is called by the prophet Isaiah, the Prince of Peace. And yet, when we look around the world, we see not just fist fights, but full-scale wars. And it's not just around the world. But here in our own country, too, that we see people fighting, maybe not with fists, although sometimes I think we see that, too, but with angry words and accusations. And we can bring it home even a little closer as we look around at families that we know personally who have brothers and sisters or moms and dads or aunts and uncles or grandparents who are at odds with one another, some even totally estranged from each other. So what are we to do? We're tempted to cry out, is peace even possible today? We grumble and bemoan all that is going on. We shake our heads in sadness as we simply accept that this is just the way it is. And yet, 
yet in the midst of this, if we listen closely enough, we can hear Jesus saying, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And if we're really attentive, then we can hear Paul urging us to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so I really don't think that we can just shake our heads and accept defeat and do nothing. But what can we do? As we begin this new year, I believe that God might be reminding us that if there is to be peace anywhere today, then it must actually begin with each one of us. Now, maybe that sounds a little trite, but I think it's true. It, it's true because, because each one of us must first find peace with God before we can find peace with anyone else else. A Daily Bread devotional writer recently wrote, God is a God of love and peace. God is a God of love and peace. Conflict comes because of our rebellion against him. Sin destroys the world's peace and robs each of us of inner peace, but Jesus, Jesus came to this earth to reconcile us to God and give us that inner peace. The writer of Romans declares, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the very first step to finding, having, promoting, and making peace with anyone or anything is to confess our need for our Savior and for the peace that he brought between God and us through his death and resurrection. When we sing, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, these are more than just pretty words. They are the truth. And they are the beginning to the peace that we all pray for. We must dig deep into our souls and find that perfect peace that God has given to us through Jesus Christ, a peace that can never be shaken or taken from us. In a book that is entitled, the king's business, we read this little tidbit. They said, in some old castles are found deep wells that are meant to supply the armies in times of siege. An aqueduct bringing water from without would be at the mercy of the enemy, but the foe has no power over the well inside. The peace the world seeks depends on our surroundings. And in times of trouble, then its source is cut off. But the peace of Christ is that well that is deep inside of each of us. And this peace, this peace of Christ, this peace that we can find only deep inside our personal relationship with him is the true source of all peace. And so... Letting there be peace on earth does begin with each one of us as we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. But once that reconciliation begins, then we still have a lot of work to do in order to truly be peacemakers. And that's where I believe that Paul's words to the church at Philippi that I just read offer us some good advice on how we can begin to make peace around the world. He writes to the whole church, but again, I believe it's something that each one of us must make a conscientious decision to to do ourselves before it can transform, transfer to the world around us. And so as we briefly walk through his words this morning, I invite each one of us to ponder how we as individuals can begin to put these truths to work in our own lives so that peace might begin with us and then extend out to those around us. Paul begins with these words, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. His opening words remind us that we are always to be rejoicing and thanking God. And so peace can begin with us once we thank God in all things and for all things. And what this really comes down to is watching what we say, 
or making sure that what comes out of our mouths is praiseworthy and not critical. I read a cute Peanuts cartoon the other day that went like this. In the first frame, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole world. In the next frame, Charlie Brown says to her, but I thought you had inner peace. And finally, in the last frame, Lucy responds, I do have inner peace, but I still have outer obnoxiousness. <laughs> I'm not sure if Lucy's gotten it right yet or not. But I do know that if we truly have inner peace, then it must reflect through what comes out of our mouths. And what should come out of our mouths should be praise and thanksgiving and rejoicing. Now, James has a lot to say to us about that. In his third chapter in his letter, he talks about taming the tongue. Listen to what he says. He says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, that should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. If we truly want to be peacemakers, then we must tame our tongue and make sure that what comes out of our mouths is blessing and not curses. So we should rejoice in the Lord always and again rejoice. But Paul follows these words with some more that lead us towards ways of peace. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Now, we talked about gentleness a, a while back as we um, examined the fruits of the Spirit. And while we did this, we came up with some definitions for gentleness. Gentleness is the quality of being kind, tender, or mild-mannered. It's the sensitivity of disposition and kindness of behavior that's founded on strength and prompted by love. So according to Paul, the second thing that we can do to be a peacemaker is to be gentle and kind with everyone. And according to the definitions, this means that we are to speak tenderly, to be mild-mannered or even tempered, and that these behaviors are signs of strength and not weakness, and perhaps most importantly, they are founded on and driven by a love for all humankind. Focus on the Family did a series on the fruit of the Spirit, and they entitled one of them, The Strength of Gentleness. I was reading some of it, and I found these powerful words. They said, gentleness is a strong hand with a soft touch. It is a tender, compassionate approach toward others' weaknesses and limitations. A gentle person speaks truth, sometimes even painful truth, but in so doing guards his tone so that the truth can be well received. They cited the Apostle Paul as an example. Now, when we think of Paul, I'm not sure we always think of him as being gentle. He's pretty direct when he speaks to the churches. He comes across pretty strongly with some demands. And yet in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, Paul says this. He says, we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her children. Gentleness promotes peace. Gentleness builds respect among people. Gentleness opens the door to communication between two or more parties because when we are gentle in how we speak to and treat others, then they will truly believe that we want to hear from them and know what they are feeling and going through. Like many of you, I watched the funeral services for the late President George H.W. Bush several weeks ago. And as I listened to things being said and stories being told about him, I could see that he was a gentle man. One story was told about the time that he went to visit a cancer center for children with leukemia. As he stood before a small boy who had the same dreadful disease that had taken the life of Bush's three-year-old daughter many years prior to that, the president broke down and began to cry. Now he's got reporters and all behind him. 
And he said later in a diary, he apparently kept a spoken diary, and he said that he stayed facing that young boy that day instead of turning away because he hoped that through his tears that young child would somehow know that he was loved and understood. Our words, our actions should be filled with gentleness so that people around us can know that they are loved and that they are understood because if they know that they are loved and understood, even if we disagree with them or even if they are different from us, there can still be peace between us. And so as we rejoice always, we must also allow our gentleness to be evident to all if we truly want to be filled with the peace of God and be peacemakers ourselves. But then Paul gives us our final little piece of wisdom. He says, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. This verse helps us so much when we're trying to build peace because, you see, being a peacemaker is not easy. We find ourselves in the middle of things that we don't want to be in the middle of. We find ourselves dealing with people that we'd rather not be dealing with. And so we begin to become anxious and worried and upset. But Paul tells us to push the pause button and to remember something, that God is near. That God is with us even in the midst of turmoil and strife. God is there too. And so because God is near them, we don't have to be anxious about anything. Instead, we can simply pause and pray. Placing the people that we are dealing with and the situations that we are facing into God's hands. And so the final piece from Paul that helps us to be peacemakers is to give it all to God in prayer. Turn it over to God. Seek God's wisdom. Ask God what to do. Allow God to work his perfect ways through us. This helps bring about peace because, you see, when we do things our way, what happens? We often interject our own anger, our own biases or bitterness. But if we give it to God and allow God to speak instead through us, then God speaks above our inadequacies. A devotional writer once told the story about Robert Louis Stevenson, who said to his mother when he was a young boy, Mama, you can't be good without praying. His mother asked, How do you know that, Robert? And he replied, Because I've tried. <laughs> the writer went on to tell another story about a little boy who had been sent to his room because he had been bad. So a short time later, he comes out and he says to his mother, He says, I've been thinking about what I did, and I said a little prayer. His mother replied, that's wonderful, son. If you ask God to make you good, he'll help you. To which the little boy answered, oh, I didn't ask him to help me be good. I asked him to help you put up with me. <laughs> that's a good prayer, isn't it? <laughs> ask God to help us put up with those people that are a little harder. When we are facing times of unrest, when we are facing situations where peace seems absent, when we are dealing with people who are anything but peaceful, then we must pray. Pray to be good, yes. Pray and ask God to help us put up with whatever we're in the middle of so that we can be peacemakers instead of instigators. So that we can speak words of blessings and not curses. So that we can build people up and not tear people down. God is near, and God wants to hear from us so that he can, he can flood our souls with peace so that peace can then flow out from us to those around us. Rejoice always. Let your gentleness be evident, and pray about everything and everyone. These are three concrete things that we can do to help make the world a more peaceful place and 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 the end of what paul says is that if we will do these things then god promises that the peace of christ which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus can there be peace in our world today maybe not fully and everywhere until christ returns 
But I do believe that there can be glimpses of that eternal peace, even in a world that is torn apart by war and divided in so many ways. There can be peace, or Jesus would not have called peacemakers blessed. And Paul would not have urged us to do all we can to maintain peace. There can be peace where we are if we will work hard to build it. And remember... It all begins within each one of us as we who are reconciled to God through Christ have that great and awesome inner peace. As I close, I want to share a final story that I read entitled The Rest of a Soul. It's a story about a woman who was dying. She was there in the hospital and the minister sat beside her and he was trying to break the news to her as gently as he could. He said they they think your time is short. Yes, she said, I know. He continued, have you made peace with God? And the woman quickly answered, no. Now the minister was puzzled until finally the woman explained. She says, I know I'm dying, yet I have no fear of meeting God. For I am resting in the peace which Jesus Christ made in his atoning death upon the cross. I don't have to make my peace with God, for I am resting in the peace that Jesus has already made for me. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul declares. As we begin this new year, no matter what other resolutions we make. Let's be determined to begin and then to carry out through this whole year a great effort to make peace whenever we can. It's a new day. It's a new year. It's a new beginning. Oh, that we will begin with peace, first with ourselves and then with one another. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.